Hey gang, thanks for joining me again today. Today we are going to look at the strategy of God to win the whole world to Himself. I know, you might be thinking, wow, that's a big task. Well, it's based on, well, you're going to see. You know, um, and there's a main verse that I want to I wanna share out of Matthew chapter 24. And if you know anything about Matthew chapter 24, it's talking about the last days. So in my quest to get through the Bible two or three times a year by listening to it, I heard this just part of this. I heard this verse in that part of the Bible and, and it just jumped out at me. Um, and so last week we looked at salvation. And this week, we're going to look at the power behind it, okay? You know, um, but before, before I go on, let me ask you some questions. <clears throat> Who or what do you know is successful? And have you ever wondered why they are successful? And the Bible talks about how we can be successful in everything that we do. And um, there is one thing that the Bible says that cannot be defeated. It cannot fail. It cannot be overcome. And it doesn't become frustrated and just want to quit. <laughs> you know what that is? That's right. First Corinthians chapter 13 in verse 8 says, Love never fails. You know, so, uh, can it give up? Can love give up? Can it walk away when it's needed? Can it ignore things that are wrong? Can it condemn? Can it become overwhelmed? No, it cannot because it never fails. Love never fails. So, we're going to look at some verses that prove God's love for us. And of course, the most famous, John 3, 16. I just said that, and all of you are going through it in your head already. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. What about the next verse? I like the next verse too. And maybe the next two verses. Verse 17 says, For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world. Now remember that now. He didn't send Jesus into the world to condemn the world. So parts of these messages you're going to feel like he's not talking to us. He's talking to the world. Or am I? <laughs> he did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him or that the world might be saved through him. Verse 18 says, whoever believes in him is not condemned. Wow. Reminds me of Romans chapter 8 and verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Okay, so it goes on. He says, but whoever does not believe stands, all, stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of, the, of God's one and only Son. And wow, how does that prove the love of God? God doesn't want anyone. To perish. John chapter 1 in verse 12 says, But as many as receive him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God, to those who believe in his name. Man, that gives everybody a chance, right? What about 2 Peter chapter 3 in verse 9? It says, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise. You know, they were grumbling about, when is the Lord coming? You know, he's always said he's going to come. And he's not, you know, how come he's taking so long and all of that? <laughs> so Peter was dealing with, with the church then. Sounds like something that we deal with the church now, right? When is Jesus coming back? This world's getting so bad, right? It says, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. And Romans chapter 8 and verse 28, And we know 
that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have not, or who have been called according to his purpose. And then Romans chapter 8 and verse 1, I mentioned that there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Here's a story about this love, okay? Excuse me, that's something bothering me. There. Okay, verse 2 in, well, let me see. Did I write down the reference? I'll put the reference in there. Okay, in verse 2, <laughs> it says, At dawn he appeared again in the temple courts, where all the people gathered around him and sat down to, and he sat down to teach them. And the teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law of Moses, or in, in the law of Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. Then they kept on questioning him. What do you say? What do you say? He straightened up and said to them, Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Now, who was Jesus talking to? He was talking to the religious leaders. He wasn't talking to this woman. He was talking to these religious leaders. If you don't have any sin, go ahead, throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time. The older ones first until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. And Jesus straightened up, or stood up, and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Now go and leave your life of sin. Wow. How many times we are caught and we think nobody's watching <laughs> and Jesus catches us in the act but his response to our sin is I'm not here to condemn you but to save you but don't keep living like you're living right you see, God's love pardons those who admit they are sinners and even when they are caught in the middle of it. No one can love like Jesus, God, or the Holy Spirit through mere effort. We need help. So in the, in the book of Zechariah, chapter 4 and verse 6, it says, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. So, with saying all of that, here is the verse I want to share with you about the last days. Because we in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus is asked about when the end times is coming. In fact, Jesus is telling his disciples what will happen in the last days. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 12. In the NIV, or the New International Version of the Bible, it says, Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of many will grow cold. The New Living Translation says this, Sin will be rampant everywhere, and the love of many will grow cold. The English Standard Version says this, And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. You know, I want to stop right here and say something. Um, 
I heard that in San Francisco, if you park your car in San Francisco, downtown San Francisco, the people don't, and they don't lock their cars. They leave the windows down and the trunk open because if not, somebody's going to break in and try to steal their stuff. I think that's wickedness, right? So the Berean Standard Bible says this, because of the multiplication of wickedness, the love of many will grow cold. And then, of course, the good old faithful King James says, And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. You know, how I translate this is this way. Because others are sinning and so sinful, this means many believers' love will grow cold for them. Wow. Remember, the Bible was not written to the world. It was written for the church. But that's how the world gets its message. The gospel is through the church, us sharing the word of God. So if Jesus is the Lord of our lives, you know, are we willing to say when people sin against us, are we willing to say the same thing Jesus said, Father, forgive them? Because they don't know what they're doing. That's in Luke chapter 23 and verse 20, uh, 34. You know, you see, if we are disarmed, then we become prey for the enemy. We become powerless to affect change in the world. You might say disarmed. Yeah, because when we don't have love that helps us succeed in everything, then we're disarmed. It's like a, a plumber coming to your house and he says, oh, where's the problem? Oh, I see the problem. There's a leak there. He said, well, are you going to fix it? No, I didn't bring my tools. You know, he's powerless to help the situation, right? So we are powerless without the love of God. Jesus told this parable, and it's an ex excellent example in Matthew chapter 18, starting with verse 21. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times? Shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. In one translation, it says seven times 70. Wow, that's plenty of times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children, they all be sold to repay the debt. Of course, that debt was overwhelming. There's no way, even if they all sold, they couldn't get it. Verse 26 says, At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay you back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled his debt, and let him go. Woo-hoo, what a great day. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a few bucks. Well, it says here, a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell on his knees and begged him. Just think about this. Sounds familiar? Be patient with me and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told the master that had forgiven this servant what had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. Wow. I canceled all your debt and, and uh, uh, all your debt because you begged me. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had had on you? In anger, his 
master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he paid back all he owed. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or your sister from your heart. Don't, don't we just come, you know, didn't we just come through a season about this? You know, it's, it's the main verse that we, we looked at is the people who sat in darkness beheld a great light. And those on those in the land of, the, of deep darkness, a light has dawned. That's Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 2. You know, it's like, the, you know, how dark is that darkness? This, this servant that was forgiven, he had some darkness in his life. But he should have looked at the light that forgiveness has given him. Because God didn't come to condemn him but to save him. But I don't think he got the message. You know, we are dealing with a world that is full of wickedness. But the people of God should not be growing cold in their desire to reach the lost. You know, God's indictment um, is never against sinners or the lost. It is always against those who say they know him, but are themselves walking in darkness, whose hearts have, and love have grown cold. Wow. Jesus knew what he was talking about, about in those last days. You know, I think he was looking at our day today. You know, our response to this message should be, Lord, is it me? Or better yet, Lord, it is me. And we should repent. You know, we think that the religious people of the Bible don't exist today like Pharisees and Sadducees. But they do. You know, I wonder why they became so cold and didn't recognize Jesus as the Messiah. I think Romans chapter 1 has an answer for us. Starting with verse 18, it says, The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Who is he talking to? He's talking to the church. He's talking to believers here. Because the wicked know that they're condemned. You know, I don't, I don't, if somebody's a sinner, you don't have to, you know you're a sinner. They know that they're a sinner. So verse 18, let me read that to you again. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people. What people? The people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Now jump down to verse 21. For although they knew God, neither they, they did not glorify him as God as God. Neither did they give him thanks. But their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Or let me put it this way, became cold. Wow. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mere human beings and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts. That's what verse 24 says. You know, Jesus rebuke um, to the church of Laodicea in Revelation was this. Revelation chapter 3. To the angel of the church of Laodicea write, these are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds. You are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So, because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. Well, you know one translation says, 
the other word out of their mouth. It's a gross word. You say, I am rich. I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me, oh, to, yeah, to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be eager or uh, earnest or jump, get really excited about repenting. <laughs> it says, be earnest and repent. Here am I. And this is a famous verse. And we don't realize it goes right with this. It says, here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him. And, and they with me. So can you see the many of Matthew chapter 24 and verse uh, 12 may be us that our hearts wax cold. There was a popular singer that once sang this. I'm looking at the man in the mirror. I'm asking him to change his ways. If you don't know who that is, your education has been neglected. Of course, that's Michael Jackson. Remember, Jesus said, those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. Why? So that we will not perish with those who are the, doing the wickedness that abounds. From that same verse, Matthew, in Matthew. So, God is at work in the church and he's reminding us that we should not let, no matter how wicked the world gets, we should not let the wickedness of the world let our, our love grow cold. Because if Jesus is the Lord of your life, then it'll be like the apostle said, or like the prophet said, I cannot be quiet because it is like fire in my bones. I must tell people about Jesus. I must tell them how to get saved. I must, so that they, like Jesus said, will be born again and will not be condemned, but will be saved. Let's pray. Lord, this message is to your church. To us who say we believe. But Lord, help us not to be, or if we've already become, like those in Romans chapter 1, that, that say, oh, I know God. But don't give you thanks. And don't recognize you on a daily basis. And don't submit to you. Lord, we don't want to be like that. We want to be those that when a a cold, dark world is looking for a warm, secure place. They can come to you through your body, the church, and not be condemned, but be forgiven and given a brand new start, just like you did with us. Forgive us, Lord, for growing cold in our love. Help us, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. I hope this message spoke to you because it sure spoke to me and my heart. All right. Hi, Mom and Brother Keone. Hey, mahalo for watching. Aloha.